The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you choose to enjoy one of our themed margaritas, please ensure that you are of legal drinking age and have fun but drink responsibly. A pale, slim, frail-looking woman sat on the witness stand in a plain blue frock with a white collar and black velvet hat, revealing every detail of her tragic life in a desperate attempt to spare her husband the electric chair. For nearly four hours, she traced her entire sordid history as her husband audibly sobbed from behind the defense table. Her family unable to provide for her the things she needed in childhood, sent her out to seek her fortune outside the home. Being young and naive, an elderly seducer had wooed her as just a 16-year-old into a moment of shame. When she arrived to meet him at the Waldorf Hotel, her mother had dressed her, and then he violated her. On the stand, she revealed that when the opportunity of marrying honorably presented, she thrust herself at the opportunity. But once revealing her secrets to her newly betrothed, he raged and sought the ultimate revenge against the man who had defiled his wife. You may or may not know this, but these margaritas are designed to be themed to the mayhem of the episode. A pineapple margarita for Spongebob, a candy corn margarita for a dad who killed his kid on with Halloween candy. You get the idea. Well, when I was planning for today's case, for some reason, I decided to do a chocolate margarita. And um, I honestly have no idea why I chose this margarita. But my stubborn ass decided that instead of rethinking through it and finding a new margarita, I'll just shove it until it fits. I'm not going to tell you directly how, but you'll have to keep listening. Shockingly, I found this missing chocolate connection. It's a pretty thin connection, but for today, it's what we've got. Okay, so for this margarita, and it is decadent, we're going to take two parts tequila and just a half a part of lime juice, one part chocolate liqueur, one part heavy cream, one part triple sec, and just a drop or two of almond extract, and shake those up into our shaker. We'll strain that out. Oh, and make sure your ingredients just come cold. Let's not use any ice with this drink. We'll still strain it into a glass because, well, we're bougie. And this glass you have prepared perfectly by rimming it first in chocolate syrup and then in little chunks of chocolate. Mm. Add a dash of cinnamon to the top and uh, we're ready to go. You know, I get scared whenever I mix particular flavors with lime, but for some reason, probably all the cream and chocolate In this drink, you can't even really taste the lime. Just a hint of tart in all the right ways. I would suggest mixing a big batch of this and bringing it to a holiday party next month, especially if you need it to be around your family. Florence Evelyn Nesbitt was born on Christmas Day, either in 1884 or 1885, in Natrona, Pennsylvania, a small town near Pittsburgh. Her birth year is unknown as her birth records were destroyed in a fire, and Evelyn herself didn't really know as her mother would often add several years to her age in order to circumvent child labor laws. Evelyn also had a younger brother named Howard. Her parents were Winfield Scott Nesbitt, a lawyer, and Evelyn Florence Nesbitt, a homemaker. Yes, it it is Evelyn Florence is the mom and Florence Evelyn is the daughter and Florence Evelyn goes by Evelyn. It's very confusing. Just bear with me. Evelyn, the daughter, was particularly close to her father. She would often try to please him with her accomplishments. For his part, Winfield encouraged her self-confidence and set up a library for the young bookworm, including books that were typically regarded as boys' books of the time, in addition to fairy tales and fantasies. He encouraged her love of music and dance and paid for her to take lessons. The family moved to Pittsburgh when Evelyn was about nine. When she turned ten, her beloved father died suddenly. He was only 40 years old. Because he was the only breadwinner in the household, he left the family penniless and in debt. They lost the family home, and the possessions of everyone in the family were auctioned off to pay the debts. They were forced to depend on the charity of loved ones and relatives, as Evelyn's mother could not make a living off her dressmaking skills. Evelyn, Howard, and their mother lived in unstable housing for many years, oftentimes sharing a room in a series of boarding houses. 
Eventually, family gave Evelyn's mother money to rent a house large enough to also rent out as a boarding house. She often gave Evelyn, this time around age 12, the job of collecting the rent from boarders. Evelyn would later say, quote, Mama was always worried about the rent. It was too hard a thing for her to actually ask for every week, and it never went smoothly, end quote. Indeed, her mother was not good at the job of running a boarding house, and it eventually failed. Desperate, her mother moved to Philadelphia in 1898 and moved Evelyn and Howard to an acquaintance's house in Allegheny, Maryland, some 130 miles away. She did end up finding a job as a sales clerk at the fabric counter of a Wanamaker's department store and sent for her children to join her in Pittsburgh. Both Evelyn, aged 14, and Howard, aged 12, also became employed at Wanamaker's and joined their mother in working 12-hour days, six days a week. At the department store, Evelyn encountered a female artist who asked her to pose for a portrait. Her mother acquiesced, knowing that the artist was a woman. Evelyn earned $1 for sitting for five hours, which is the equivalent of about $33 in today's money. Still not that great, just so we're clear. $6.60 an hour is not that much. But through this opportunity, Evelyn was introduced to other Philadelphia artists and soon became a favorite model for illustrators, portrait painters, and stained glass artists. And despite what seems like a low hourly rate, it was still far more than she could make at the department store, so she convinced her mother to let her pose instead. In June 1900, Evelyn's mother again left her children in the care of others, this time moving to New York City, believing that she would be more able to find work as a seamstress or a clothing designer. The competitive market there was not kind to her, and in November, she finally brought the children to the city, despite not having a job. They shared a single back room in an apartment building on 22nd Street in Manhattan. Evelyn's modeling soon became the source of the family income, and her mother managed her career. There were several portraits where she posed partially nude. Evelyn became one of the most in-demand artist models in New York City. She was featured on the covers of Vanity Fair, Harper's Bazaar, Cosmopolitan, and several other women's magazines. She was also a featured model for fashion advertising. She is even the model for one of the most famous Gibson girl works, made by Charles Dana Gibson. Woman, the Eternal Question, shows Evelyn in profile with her long hair forming the shape of a question mark. She also became widely photographed, as photography was being more widely used in the art and advertising world. Indeed, she is rather stunning in images and paintings from the era. She was referred to by an artist as a, quote, perfectly formed nymph, end quote. Evelyn could make upwards of $325 for a day of shooting, and the artists loved her look. Despite this large increase in income, cost of living in New York City still made the family's finances strained. Evelyn soon became bored with the long hours posing for portraits and instead persuaded her mother to let her enter the theater world, which her mother ultimately agreed to as she wanted to be able to supplement their finances. It was during a show that she was in the chorus line that she officially started going by Evelyn instead of her given first name Florence, as the other cast members started calling her Flossie the Fuss, and she detested the nickname. Stanford White was born on November 9, 1853, the son of Richard Grant White and Alexina Black. His father was a Shakespearean scholar with not much money but lots of connections. Stanford got an apprenticeship in an architecture firm where he learned from one of the greatest American architects of his day, Henry Hobson Richardson, for six years. He then spent a year and a half in Europe learning about architectural history and trends, and then formed his own firm in New York City in September of 1879. In 1884, he married Bessie Springs Smith, a 22-year-old Long Island socialite who was nine years younger than him. Their son, Lawrence Grant White, was born in 1887. Stanford designed several iconic New York City landmarks, including the Triumphal Arch at Washington Square and the second Madison Square Garden. He also designed iconic buildings outside of New York City, including the Boston Public Library on Copley Square. He was a flamboyant man with red hair and a giant red mustache. He collected rare and expensive antiquities and art. He maintained a multi-story apartment on 24th Street in Manhattan. One room was painted green and outfitted with a red velvet swing. Hung from the ceiling and suspended by ropes intertwined with ivy. 
And on one night in August of 1901, when Evelyn was 16 years old, Stanford took her into that room. Stanford was introduced to Evelyn by another cast member of the play she was in, Edna Goodrich. After some niceties, Stanford took them to the green room and he put her and her young friend into the swing. According to Evelyn, quote, he pushed it so that it flew up in the air. The swing went so high that our feet kicked through a big Japanese umbrella. Stanford laughed and clapped with delight as she soared toward the ceiling. Let's not forget that Stanford was married and had a child. Evelyn was not the first young girl he would seduce in that apartment swing, but she would be one of the last. Stanford was enamored by Evelyn. He moved her entire family into a suite that he furnished at the Wellington Hotel. He paid for Howard to attend the Chester Military Academy. He paid to have Evelyn's teeth fixed. Two months after they met, Stanford paid for Evelyn's mother to visit friends in Pittsburgh, offering to take care of Evelyn while she was away. Evelyn's mother began referring to Stanford, or as he was often called, Stanny, as their benefactor. I will not be calling that man Stanny. While she was gone, Evelyn and Stanford had dinner and champagne at his apartment, but according to Evelyn, she was only permitted to eat a chocolate eclair and drink champagne. After quite a bit of champagne, Stanford asked Evelyn to change into a yellow satin kimono. It's the last thing she remembered. When she awoke, she found herself naked in bed next to Stanford, who was also naked. There was blood on the sheets. When she started to cry, he said, quote, Don't cry, kittens. It's all over. Now you belong to me. End quote. Despite the date rape, the two continued to be close companions for some time. Evelyn referred to him as her benevolent vampire. Seems there was some financial abuse and manipulation mixed in with the sexual abuse. Evelyn eventually discovered that Stanford was having affairs with lots of other young women and had written them down in his little black book. Henry Kendall Thaw was born on February 12, 1871, to Mary Sibbett Thaw and William Thaw Sr., a railroad and coal baron in Pittsburgh. Harry had 11 siblings, four half-siblings from his father's first marriage, and he was the third of six from his mother and father. Harry's older brother by one year died in infancy after a tragic accident where he was smothered by his mother's breast while she laid in bed. Mental illness seemed to run rampant in the Thaw family. His mother was known to verbally and physically abuse servants and was known to have a temper that was uncontrollable. It was also not a secret that there was other mental illness in the history of his mother's family. When Harry was a child, he threw constant temper tantrums, babbled incoherently, and was known to speak in baby talk, a habit he would retain throughout adulthood. He would, like his mother, hurl household objects at the servants and burst into laughter. He bounced around from private school to private school, known as an unintelligent troublemaker. He used his social status and lineage to enroll at the University of Pittsburgh and then eventually to transfer to Harvard, where he would later declare he studied poker. In 1894, he chased a cab driver down a street in Cambridge, wielding what he claimed was an unloaded shotgun. He was wielding the shotgun, he just claimed it was unloaded, over a disagreement of 10 cents worth of change. He was eventually expelled from Harvard for immoral practices. Hmm. Harry's father died in 1893, leaving his 22-year-old son $3 million, or the equivalent of $91.5 million today. His dad had attempted to curtail his son's excesses by only giving him $2,500, or $76,000, a month in allowance, but after his death, his mother upped that total to $243,000 a month in today's money. So, he could basically do whatever depraved and lavish thing his heart desired. His mother was known to pay off any person who may have caused a public scandal for Harry. Harry tore through Europe, going to as many brothels as possible and engaging in all manner of bondage. Not that there's anything wrong with that. He threw a $50,000 or $1.5 million party in Paris in 1895 for himself and 25 of the most beautiful showgirls and prostitutes in the area. Each girl was gifted a $30,000 piece of jewelry as the dessert course of the meal. He was also a habitual drug user, known to inject large amounts of both cocaine and morphine, sometimes mixed, into a speedball. 
It's believed that the term playboy was inspired by Harry K. Thaw and his lifestyle. The wild playboy Harry K. Thaw was introduced to Evelyn Nesbitt when he happened to be in the audience of a show where she was a featured actress, The Wild Rose. Harry was immediately enamored with her and, as a result, just kept going to watch her in the show. In fact, he watched something like 40 performances in less than a year. When he was finally able to be introduced to her, he called himself Mr. Monroe. Maybe he wanted to hide his true playboy nature from her, or maybe he just liked the drama. He began to shower Evelyn with gifts and money, and then he eventually announced his true identity. Though their relationship had cooled, Stanford had warned Evelyn against going out with Harry. Harry, for his part, had an obsessive hatred already of Stanford White, based on his belief that Stanford was both blackballing him from gaining entrance into the New York City clubs he desperately wanted to be a part of, and his treatment of the young girls in New York City. Evelyn came down with appendicitis, and Harry seized the opportunity to insert himself into her life. He showed up at the hospital, bearing gifts and impressing Evelyn's mother. He suggested a trip to Europe, convincing Evelyn and her mother that it would help her recover more quickly from her appendectomy. The ladies weren't ready for Harry's hectic speed in traveling itineraries, and it caused both a frail Evelyn and her exhausted mother to bicker with each other. Evelyn's mother insisted that she return to the United States, and Harry took Evelyn to Paris alone. In Paris, Harry proposed, and Evelyn refused. She couldn't marry him without telling him the truth about Stanford. He interrogated her for many hours, getting all the details of what happened, and becoming increasingly angry both with Stanford and with Evelyn's mother, whom he saw as an unfit parent. They continued the European tour with sights of virgin martyrdom, Harry acting increasingly agitated, and at the birthplace of the Joan of Arc, he left an inscription in the visitor's book that read, quote, She would not have been a virgin if Stanford White had been around, end quote. Oof. In a castle in the Austrian Tyrol, Harry locked Evelyn in her room and turned violent. He beat her with a whip and sexually assaulted her over and over again for two weeks. He was apologetic once the terror had ended, and she not only forgave him, but she eventually agreed to marry him. After two years of nonstop pursuit and lavishing her and her family with gifts, the two were married on April 4, 1905. Harry dressed Evelyn for the wedding in a black traveling suit decorated with brown trim. They moved into the Thaw family mansion in Pittsburgh with Harry's mother. Evelyn and Harry were headed on a European holiday in 1906 when they stopped briefly in New York City on June 25th. They had tickets to watch a new musical review on the rooftop theater of Madison Square Garden, Mademoiselle Champagne. It was the middle of summer, but Harry wore a long black overcoat over his tuxedo and refused to take it off. I bet he was pretty sweaty. Around 11 p.m., Stanford appeared and took his place at his regular table five rows from the stage. I guess if you design the place, you get your own table reserved at all times. Evelyn suggested that they leave, and as they headed toward the elevator, Harry slipped away. Harry went close to Stanford several times, and then each time backed away, kind of nervous-like. But during the show's finale song, I Could Love a Million Girls, he pulled the pistol from out of his overcoat and fired three shots at two feet of range right into Stanford White, killing him instantly. Parts of his face were actually torn away, and other parts were covered in gunpowder. That's how close Harry was. Harry declared for all to hear, quote, I did it because he ruined my wife. He had it coming to him. He took advantage of the girl and then abandoned her, end quote. At 3 a.m. the next morning, Harry K. Thaw was arrested and charged with first-degree murder and denied bail, probably because he would have immediately paid any bail and disappeared, well, anywhere else in the world. While waiting for the trial, he ate catered meals by outside restaurants and slept in a brass bed brought in especially for him. He wore custom-tailored clothes instead of the standard-issue prisoner outfit. He was given a daily ration of champagne and wine. And throughout the time before the trial while he was in jail, he believed firmly that no jury would convict him. He had rid the world of the menace that was Stanford White. 
Sensationalist reporting was the norm at the time of this case. It was the heyday of yellow journalism. Those of you who have been around for a while may remember the case of Winnie Ruth Judd and her, um, friends in the, um, suitcases. Well, this case had similar effects on the press. Yellow journalism used scandal-mongering, exaggerations, and eye-catching headlines to increase sales. Competition for newspaper sales in New York was stiff at the time, and a good headline can make the difference between a purchase and not. Not to get too off-topic, but yellow journalism is seen as a primary cause of the United States entering an entire war, the Spanish-American War. Newspapers are important. Journalism has power, always has. And sensationalist journalism can ruin a person. Just ask Evelyn Nesbitt. The newspapers in Pittsburgh had headlines like, Woman Whose Beauty Spelled Death and Ruin. Delving into the backstory of Evelyn Nesbitt became a full-time job for reporters across the country. Reporter Nixola Greeley-Smith wrote, quote, I think she was sold to one man and later sold herself to another, end quote. Nice. It wasn't just Evelyn that was exploited. Her mother was attacked. Reporters writing, quote, she knew better. She also knew she was sacrificing her child's soul for money, end quote. Even Stanford White, the victim of the murder, was plastered all over the papers. Apparently, he belonged to an underground sex circle. According to Mark Twain, an acquaintance of Stanford, he was, quote, eagerly and diligently and ravenously and remorselessly hunting young girls to their destruction, end quote. His reputation was continually damaged, even posthumously. The primary defense during the trial for Harry's actions was temporary insanity at the behest of his mother. She did not want her son's past nor her family's history of mental illness drug into the papers, and temporary insanity was a far better choice than the extreme stigma of clinical insanity. The newspapers bit this hook, line, and sinker, essentially asserting that this type of murder was totally justifiable, as he was simply revenging a woman whose chastity had been violated. For the first time in American history, the jury was sequestered due to the wild amount of publicity generated by the case. In the end, the jury was hopelessly deadlocked, seven guilty and five not guilty, after 47 hours of deliberation. Harry was outraged, flailing about the courtroom and audibly sobbing. At his second trial, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity, due in part to the convincing testimony by his wife, and he was sentenced to life incarceration at the Matawan State Hospital for the Criminally Insane in Fishkill, New York. Naturally, he had special accommodations. At one point, not wanting to be there, he escaped and went to Canada, possibly orchestrated by his mother, yet again, who was getting him out of trouble. Talk about an enabler. He was returned after an extradition battle and managed to secure another trial to determine whether or not he was actually insane. On July 16, 1915, the jury set him free. So what do you think? Was Harry justified in the murder of the man who had defiled his wife, well, before they were even together? Was he suffering from mental illness that made his actions predictable, if not horrific? How did both of these men get away with such terrible acts towards poor Evelyn? Have we moved past an era where a woman can be beaten and sexually assaulted for two weeks and still choose to marry her abuser? Will we ever move past that? Or better yet, can we move past a world where men do something like that? How might Evelyn's path have been different had she been born at another time in history? 19-year-old Lawrence Gran White was guilt-ridden after his father, Stanford White, was slain. He served in the Navy during World War I and eventually would join the same architecture firm that his father had founded and would be an architect for the rest of his career. He would marry and raise eight children with his wife. He died in 1956. In 1916, Harry Thaw was charged with the kidnapping, beating, and sexual assault of 19-year-old Frederick Gump. Despite attempting to bribe the Gump family, he was arrested, jailed, and tried, and found insane. He regained his freedom in April 1924, and it's possible that Harry's mother yet again cleaned up his messes and arrived at a settlement with the Gump family. He lived for a time in Clearbrook, Virginia, where he joined the fire department and, although viewed as eccentric, didn't have any more run-ins with the law. In 1944, he moved to Miami, Florida, and died of a heart attack there on February 22, 1947. He was 76 years old. He is buried in Allegheny Cemetery in Pittsburgh. 
Evelyn gave birth to a son, Russell William Thaw, on October 25, 1910, in Berlin, Germany. She maintained that it was in fact Harry's biological son, conceived during a conjugal visit, but Harry denied being the child's father for his entire life. She was cut off virtually entirely financially by the Thaw family, but found modest success working in vaudeville and on the silent screen. She divorced Harry in 1915 and married a dancer, Jack Clifford, in 1916. He left her in 1918, and they divorced officially in 1933. She attempted suicide in 1926 after losing a dancing job. She received $10,000 from Harry Thaw's estate when he died in 1947 out of an estimated $1 million. If y'all are counting, he's, he, spent, he spent over $90 million um, in, in past money, uh, yeah, in the course of his lifetime. For a time, Evelyn was a ceramics and sculpting teacher at the Grant Beach School of Arts and Crafts. Evelyn Nesbitt died in a nursing home in Santa Monica, California on January 17, 1967. She was 82 years old. She is buried at Holy Cross Cemetery in Culver City, California. Russell, Evelyn's son, became a pilot and had three children with his second wife before dying in 1984. Thanks for hanging out with me. This story was a wild ride with a surprising amount of details for the time in which the crime occurred. I'll chalk it up to all that yellow journalism and hope that it's as accurate as it can be. You never can tell. Oh, and did you hear that connection to chocolate? Three cheers and a medal if you did. We're off next week for the Thanksgiving holiday and hope that you'll be safe and around loved ones and also honoring the hurt and pain experienced by indigenous communities during this difficult day for them. Thanksgiving is a complicated one for me for sure, but I think gratitude is a good thing. I'm certainly grateful for all of you. Thank you for liking, subscribing, hitting the bell for notifications, hanging out on social media, giving me ideas for cases, submitting reviews and stars, and listening each and every week. These episodes can be a lot of work, but it's worth it knowing that there are at least some people out there enjoying them. For the first two weeks in December, we'll be doing some recaps of our first season of Marks and Mayhem. Top 10 Marks and Top 10 Mayhems. Head to Instagram in particular to help us make those determinations. I'll see you next week. And remember, there are always alternatives to murder.